FreeBSD is not a Linux distro. Um, <clears throat> I actually proposed this mostly as a gag, but then I realized that the question I get asked most often by non, by less technical crowds, for instance, is uh, FreeBSD is what is that a distro of Linux? Like, no, it's not a, a distro of Linux. So I'm George Neville Neal. I've done a lot of things around FreeBSD and uh, actually around the BSDs even before that uh, for quite a while. And uh, we're really happy that DigitalOcean is providing FreeBSD on their platform. And when they asked me to come and talk about FreeBSD, I said, sure. So um, quick overview, I'm just gonna talk, by the way, I'm really happy that your slides were similarly not marketing-like, because like I could use Keynote, but I hate it. So this is in LaTeX, because I'm that old. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about FreeBSD, some of the history of BSD, just sort of people have, so people have an idea of what this stuff is, where it came from, uh, why it's here, why you might want to use it, uh, why people care about it. Talk about some of the current features. So I'm going to skip over a lot of the middle of the, of the story and talk about some of the stuff that we're doing for the next release, FreeBSD 11. Uh, a little bit about me. I mean, I can't really say anything more than Neil already said because he said all these great things about me. So th this is who I am a lot of FreeBSD in there, and, and also I, I am code vicious. Um, so what is FreeBSD? So one of the things Neil said in his presentation was talking about how the system's complete. So when you install FreeBSD, you have compilers, you have editors, you have all the things that we believe you need uh, to start doing sort of C and C++ development. Now for those people who want to do Java, you'll have to install that. Um, but that's why we have 24,000 plus ports, right? So there's the ports and package system, and everything that's, um, it would seem that everything that's ever been written since 1972 has been ported in some way into everyone's package system. There's code in there that I, I know runs, but I don't know why. Um, <laughs> we're really big on documentation. I've now written, um, co-authored two books on the FreeBSD operating system on the kernel internals, but the documentation team for the project is a pretty big team, actually. It's, uh, I think it's more than 30 people. It might be more than that if you include everyone who's translating it. And the FreeBSD handbook is really amazing. It's, it's interesting that the first thing people usually say to me when they meet me and they talk about FreeBSD is like, oh, the handbook's great. I'm like, yeah, I wrote this textbook. <laughs> They're like, no, the, the handbook is really good. I'm like, okay, that's, thank you. Um, we're really big on, big on documentation. And one of the reasons, and I'll explain that a little bit more, comes out of uh, sort of the history of the BSDs and of FreeBSD. Uh, and also FreeBSD is an open source community, right? I mean, it's, you know, there's over 300 developers working on the kernel and on user space and on the tools and on the ports and packages. Um, it's a large global community of people working on a big open source project, uh, which is now more than 20 years old. It's one of the oldest uh, open source projects. It's also one of the, it's the longest lived democratically run open source project. So there is no single Linux, right? There's no, there's no Andy Tannenbaum for Linux. There's no Linus for Linux. Um, we're run by a core team. The core team is elected every two years. Uh, I've served three times on the core team. <clears throat> and it's all good developers. One of the nice things about doing a democracy with engineers is engineers know how much work actually telling people what to do is. So no one ever runs for core unless you convince them. Like nobody thinks it's gonna be great to be on core. <laughs> We're all like, all right, this needs to get done. Yes, I'll do it, fine. Um, so more than 20 years of, of basically elections every so many years to actually manage the project. So who uses FreeBSD? This is a, a, a question I get asked a lot, and you'll recognize some of these names. Um, you know, if you're holding an Apple device or you're using an Apple laptop, there is a bunch of FreeBSD in that. Uh, in particular, I'm very happy that they continue to use bits of our network stack because that's what I work on. Uh, but a lot of other companies have built FreeBSD into things. So what you see it here is a lot of folks like NetApp, Isilon, the Dell case folks, Panassas, people who do uh, file storage devices. Most of the email that is processed on the internet is sitting somewhere on a FreeBSD device or inside the NSA, which may also be using FreeBSD, but they're not on the list. Um, and they haven't donated to the foundation yet, so we're not putting them up there. Um, Apple, uh, a lot of networking people, the BSDs have a really long and strong history in the networking area because of the fact that the TCP IP protocols were in part originally written on the BSDs. Um, so you get people like Limelight Networks, uh, Norris, who are building a networking appliance, Swisscom, Centex, or an ISP. Um, one of the most valuable acquisitions last year, which was WhatsApp, uh, used FreeBSD for a, a complete communications system. And you know, 
Turns out that's worth billions of dollars. Uh, Juniper switches, VeriSign actually runs, um, VeriSign does something very interesting. They run uh, half of some form of Linux and half FreeBSD because if there is a zero day against Linux, then the FreeBSD won't explode. And if there's a zero day against FreeBSD, the Linux won't explode. But they're both using the same version of OpenSSL. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, I don't work on that code. Uh, so VeriSign, um, some folks I'm working with right now, Perseus Telecom, they're a big a networking provider to um, finance, but they're rolling out uh, what's called high performance time service, and that's all being built with FreeBSD boxes to do uh, really accurate clocks. Um, so that's pretty cool. Sony, if you've got a PS4, you're running Clang LLVM and FreeBSD inside that somewhere. Uh, they actually cop to it now. When they did the PS3, they wouldn't cop to it. When they did the PS4, they asked so many questions on the mailing list, they finally <laughs> were like, you're using FreeBSD, uh, sort of. Um, don't make me send the North Koreans after you. Um, my previous employer who does high frequency trading on Wall Street, Hudson River Trading, FreeBSD, McAfee, uh, NYI, which is a, a big uh, hosting company here in New York, and Yahoo. So, and, and many, many more. It's, what's interesting about working on a project where we use a license that doesn't force sharing like a GPL is people will just take our code and they'll use it for years. And then when they have a problem, they show up. And they're like, I'd really like to do this thing. And we're like, oh, well, that's a really interesting business you've built over there. Um, be a shame if something happened to it. So, <laughs> uh, but, so it's, it's interesting. You get, you get FreeBSD built into a lot of things. It's inside, it's inside Panasonic televisions, which was sort of like you, you find this out by, I mean, how many people read the manual when they buy a piece of electronics? Okay, me and three other people. But you, now, if you go to the back, you can find out what's in the thing because people put in the license. They're like, wait, there's a BSD license in this TV manual. This is really strange. Um, so why do people use FreeBSD? Well, history of innovation, anyone who works on software is going to say that. Um, really great tools. So one of the reasons I was attracted to the BSDs initially is that there were just really good tools for performance analysis and compilers and, and just the things that a, a geek wants in building a, a product or a piece of software. Um, mature release model. So. The FreeBSD project and the BSD projects generally, you know, have always used source code control back to something called SCCS. And I think there's only two people in the room who thankfully have ever had to use that. That's me and him. Um, but you can actually go online right now. We've got all the sources. You can go back to the 19, possibly the 70s, but all the way back to the early 1980s and see the operating system over time. And so we've always maintained this model of, you know, very defined releases and, and very defined features and a lot of heavy testing documentation. And uh, I mentioned the business-friendly license, so I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. So here's a 30 years and three minutes or less. Uh, we all know about there was this thing called Multics. That's where Unix gets its name from. There were these folks over in New Jersey called Bell Lab. They built something that was better than Multics because they didn't do everything to everything. Um, but here's where Berkeley gets involved. So at the time, you could get Unix for your research environment, which had a multi-million dollar massive computer that took up this entire room, um, or at least some chunk of it. <clears throat> um, and you gave AT&T $1,000, which was not a lot, which is more money than it is now, but it was still not a lot of money. And then your university generally could use Unix. And Berkeley was one of the licensees, early licensees of Unix, and they found that Unix was wanting, so they started writing stuff for it. Uh, in particular, they wrote VI. I'm told that VI was written while Bill Joy was watching the early reruns of Star Trek, which explains a lot. Um, <laughs> Pascal compiler, which McKusick worked on, but it was basically a, a tools tape. You would get, and it was a tape. There were these things, they, like you've seen the old movies that go around like this. You got a tape, like a nine track tape of data. Uh, and you, all you had to do was prove that you had the Unix license and the Berkeley folks would be like, there you go, have a tape, we'll put it in. I guess FedEx existed by then, but maybe they put it in USPS or, or the Pony Express bought you a tape. I'm not sure how the tape got to you, but you can get a tape. Um, so this is the early 1980s. There's a research group at Berkeley, the Computer Systems Research Group, that's CSRG. And the Defense Department comes along, DARPA, and they say, all right, look, all of our researchers have different operating systems. There's some version of Unix, there's some version of something from Data General, and then Dex got Ristis, and there are all these things. And we don't like that because we're all about standardization because that's how militaries work. And they said, we want to, you know, we want one ring to rule them all. Uh, and Berkeley said, we could write that because, you know, Berkeley, they're really pro-military. 
Um, so somehow DARPA believed this was a good idea. And uh, you know, they had the, the early internet where the links, the long links were 56 kilobits per second. And there were like eight sites. And you know, this is the early, the early development of TCP IP and the internet. And so that and Berkeley Unix become the thing that people start running for all their research clusters and all their research stuff on the internet. So CSRG builds this stuff. They spend the next decade doing that. And then one of the guys there, really, really smart guy and really good at convincing people to do work, says, you know, we could give all of this away if we could just get rid of all these AT&T files. Like, we could get people to rewrite the memory allocator and, you know, this bit of the compiler and these things. And we use, you know, they were going to use GCC, which is eventually what they used instead of the AT&T compiler. If we could just get rid of that stuff, we could give this away. And uh, he was a member of the CSRG. And Kirk, who I wrote the book with, one of the other authors, who was running CSRG at the time, said, well, if you can get people to remove all that code, we can ship it. And then Kirk went, that's going to work. And then in a year, it was all gone, and there were only six files left, because Keith is really, really good at conning people into do work. So you know, within a year or two, they had a com nearly completely clean system. Uh, they rewrote all of the AT&T code, except for six files, which caused a bit of a problem. <clears throat> and then uh, they, uh, CSRG was no longer being funded by the government. You know, the government was like, well, we got, we've got our Berkeley Unix thing. We're very happy. Thank you very much. And those folks were like, we're going to go into Silicon Valley and start companies, do things like that. So Group B went off and built a 386, back when there were only 386s, uh, version of Berkeley Unix. And they set up a company. It's called BSDI. And they made their phone number 1-800-IT'S-UNIX. And you know, that would be the equivalent now of setting up a search engine and putting 1-800-IT'S-Google on your website, right? That's sue me. So they did. Um, and this tied up the code for over a year, uh, where basically AT&T at the time sued first BSDI, but BSDI was a tiny company. Why sue them? So sue the entire state of California, because they're big. And they have pockets, and they have taxpayers who will pay off the, uh, the debt. Um, but this, the uh, case was adjudicated in California instead of on the East Coast. And it turns out the judges in California like California universities more than they like East Coast companies. <laughs> Just saying, probably no bias, but you got to pick your venue. Uh, lawsuit goes against AT&T, and you get the first actual release of the BSDs. So at that point, BSD is free. Um, and at the time, I was running Plan 9 as a research project because my boss required me to. And then I installed NetBSD 0.9 the next day. So um, OpenBSD was mentioned. There are a few uh, operating systems in the, in the BSD world uh, which were you know, branched. So the, the lawsuit's pretty much done in 92, 93. And then you get um, what we now call forks. But at the, at the time, none of this, you know, none of these None of these terms existed. In fact, at this point, which I feel really old right now, um, over 20 years ago, there really was no concept of open source. Right? I mean, the FSF existed and there was a GPL license, but the open source community didn't exist. It was, we were just giving away software because we wanted to work on it somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> so right off, you've got NetBSD and FreeBSD. NetBSD, like the original BSD Unixes from Berkeley, tries to run on everything. And actually, NetBSD will still run on a VAX, if you can find one, um, or you can simulate one on the internet or on my watch. Um, <laughs> NetBSD will run on everything. They're really amazing that way. And that's been their commitment the whole time. They're like, we're going to keep doing interesting, innovative stuff, but we're going to do it on every single platform. I, so props to them, because it would kill me. Um, FreeBSD folks go after the Intel market. They're like, look, everybody's got these servers. And we're just going to be, we're going to support all the drivers, and we're going to be rock solid on those servers, and we're just going to make sure that stuff works. Um, and that's how I wound up running free instead of net, because it ran on all my laptops. And I'm a big fan of laptops. I basically work almost unique, exclusively for the last 15 years from a laptop. I, mean, I have servers somewhere, but I've never seen them. I mean, I believe they exist. Um, <laughs> they exist only in the mind of God. So FreeBSD comes from that. And then there's the fork with OpenBSD where the OpenBSD folks say, well, we're going to concentrate on security. And, and they really have. And as someone who, when I worked at Yahoo, my title was Paranoid. I had a card that said Paranoid Yahoo on it. Those people make me seem normal. So uh, they're really into the security thing. And then around 2006, um, 
you know, all the BSDs have always had X windows because everybody has X windows. Um, but there was a, a bunch of folks who wanted to have something that when you installed it, it gave you a more of a distro actual experience where you'd get it and it would come up and you'd have KDE or GNOME or something like that. Personally, if I boot a machine and it doesn't show me a, like a, just a login prompt, I feel uncomfortable because I don't trust what's behind all the pretty. Um, so FreeBSD project and the FreeBSD, you know, the BSD license. Uh, very simple philosophy, do not sue us. You read the license, it pretty much says, you have, you know, if you cut yourself with this, we're really sorry, but don't sue us. Uh, we really like people to use our code. One of the reasons that we use a very permissive license, which has generated plenty of arguments between different open source groups over the years, is all we really care about is that people are using our code and they find it useful and that, and that it's good for them. Like we don't force people to give back, we really want the code to just run. Um, and then FreeBSD specifically, produce a whole system ready for development. Now, what that means has changed over time, but I have to tell you that every time I install a distro and it doesn't have an NFS server in it, I'm really confused. There's just things that are oddly missing. It's like, look, I just want this box to work. So we produce a whole system, operating system, drivers, compilers, and associated tools, um, debugging tools, editors, packaging system, uh, ready to code. I'm going to stop for a moment and say questions. Yes, why is an NFS server part of a complete system? Because if I don't have an NFS server, then I can't actually mount things on it. Like often, so I work on a lot of servers. So if I have something that's sitting there and I can't actually have someone else talk to it in some reasonable way, then it just doesn't work. Um, that's not true if I'm doing a LAMP or a FAMP as we would call it on our side. Our side. It's like, sure, then what I care about is Apache and MySQL or Postgres in our case. We, do, we use MySQL, we find Postgres performance better. Um, but there, and that's just an example. There are just all these things that when I, like someone makes me install Ubuntu, which I realize stands for, I don't understand how to install Linux. But if someone says you must use Ubuntu, I'm like, this, what, wh why are those things not here? Just give me it all. So uh, some recent, recent things. So we've got, um, I'll talk about these in a little more detail. FFS or UFS was mentioned. Uh, UFS and Z ZFS are the two major um, file systems. Dtrace is my f absolute favorite feature of the last few years. Um, VNet jails, new compilers, um, a bunch of security stuff, and then, oh yeah, uh, we can run Linux binaries. So there's this thing called the Linuxulator. If you want to run a Linux binary on FreeBSD, you can do that. In particular, I believe someone just ran Doom recently, which is the, that's the test, right? It's like, oh, I can run Doom inside the Linuxulator. I'm like. Okay, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, let's talk about file systems. So in FreeBSD, I mean, we, we can support any file system you like because it's a really nice, clean interface to both the low-level block uh, devices and to user space, right? Just, you know, that's sort of the traditional Unix model anyway. But there's two that you'll really come across, and that's UFS, which is kind of, which is now more than 20 years old, um, and has this really amusing, um, History. So every time someone comes up with a new thing, like they're like, oh, well, we're going to do log based file systems because log based file systems are faster. And then there's a paper at a conference somewhere that says log based file systems are faster. And then a year later, McCusick and a few people who work on FFS or UFS come out and go, yeah, well, actually, it, that was just metadata updates. We fixed that. And then UFS is faster again. Uh, oh, we, we, you can't do snapshots. Oh, we can do snapshots a year later. And then now, journal soft updates. So when you crash a system, I mean, I know the systems never crash. But just in case, if it ever happened to you. Um, and yeah, as, as we got to very large disks, when you had to go back and figure out what was wrong in the file system and reconnect everything and try not to lose everybody's files, um, that took a long time. So everybody knows, everybody's seen FSCK run on various systems, which we like to call FSUC. I had never heard it called that till recently, but I still like it really a lot. So journal soft updates do this for you. It's like, Got metadata updates, their journal, that's a little tiny journal, not a journal of everything. And if you, you know, do this and pull the power out of a server or crash it, then that will restore your system really fast. So that's one of the, one of the newer things. But the one thing that UFS does not do is all the sort of modern volume management. I've got a million disks and I want them rated in this way and then I want, you know, all these crazy sort of server side, SAN side stuff. Um, and so that's where we get ZFS. And ZFS was done in Solaris, 
we're very happy that the Solaris folks did it because then we can take it. Um, <laughs> Zettabyte, Zettabyte file system, it's got all that stuff. It's got the volume manager and RAID and it's fully up to date in FreeBSDs. Right? Some of the folks who worked on ZFS for Sun are now committers on the FreeBSD project so that their code can live on, um, which is good. And this is the thing that people use when they're setting up a huge data center. It's like, I've got to have a huge amount of data and I'm going to you know, put that somewhere and I want to manage in some reasonable way. Generally, that's going to run on ZFS. Um, some security features. Security is a big thing for the FreeBSD project and for the BSDs in general. Uh, it helps when it helps when one of the when the first internet worm back when it, that was sort of a benign thing basically ran against your system to make you think oh, we're going to think about security from now on. Um, <clears throat> jails are a way of doing containerization of applications within FreeBSD. It's sort of people like to think of it as lightweight KVM and think of it in a bunch of different ways. But you take everything, you put it in a jail. And you can run your mail server in a jail, and you can run your Apache server in a jail, and you can run your other server in a jail, and they can't interfere with each other. Um, the Mac framework, which is mandatory access control, this is for people who are more of a more military or paranoid mindset. Um, this is the, the kind of stuff where the system will say, you know, are you, you know, we'll give you much more fine grained access controls to different things. Can you actually open this file? Can you actually get at that? Um, and most recently, Capsicum. Uh, which is a really interesting project uh, for doing um, basically just really high level uh, sort of security stuff on FreeBSD. That's a project that was at uh, University of Cambridge uh, in the UK and there's a bunch of, of new work going on there. So a bunch of security features. Tooling, I said tooling is important. So um, LLVM and Clang. So if, if you want to thank Richard Stallman for GPLv3, you should thank him for this because that's the reason that exists. So Clang and LLVM are really nice, very modern, well-architected compiler tool chain. And if you ever want to do something like have a compiler that can generate GPU instructions intelligently, then you want to use this and not GCC. <clears throat> and the reason these exist is because there were some folks at the University of Urbana-Champaign who were building this cool little system and then Stallman says, GCC is going to be GPL v3, and Apple says, well, that's not going to work very well. I think they said something else, but they had lawyers who said it nicely. Um, and they happened to find this project, and they said to them, yeah, it's a nice compiler you've got there. How would you like many millions of dollars in an entire team to develop it? Because we can't have a GPL v3 compiler in our operating system. So LLVM and Clang and LLDB, which is the new debugger, come out of basically Apple's money research at Urbana-Champaign and a bunch of developers who work really hard on it. And it's a much nicer compiler uh, tool chain. In particular, it's really extensible. So retargeting it to different architectures, if you care about that, which you probably wouldn't in a cloud environment, really nice. So when I want to run FreeBSD on my BeagleBone Black, which is in my bag, <clears throat> uh, these provide that. And last, it's uh, funny, I, did I make an old, a whole slide? Oh, I did. Dtrace, uh, it's my favorite feature. So Dtrace provides complete system transparency. Um, it's also, by the way, a rootkit. So if you turn on access to Dtrace and someone is running it, they can see everything. Um, but the fact that you can see everything for basically systems programmers and systems administrators and people who configure systems is just an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, you can see inside any call or return in the system in user space or in the kernel. You can see all of the arguments that were passed. You can see what disk blocks are going where, and you can see which sockets are doing what. And there is a whole toolkit of scripts that was written for this, which are being rewritten now. They were originally written for, uh, Dtrace comes from, again, from Sun, uh, from Solaris. So the toolkit was originally written against Solaris, which has very different kernel structures. But as a debugging tool or, you know, my favorite example of this is people will say, oh, you know, this application's really slow which is always a great thing. You love those bug reports, right? It's, it's slow. Okay, what are you doing? Um, well, someone could say it's slow and you run, you know, things like ktrace and strace and a bunch of the other tracing things that have been written before are very intrusive. And so if there's a timing issue, often they will mask it. Um, they're also very heavyweight. Dtrace is super, super light. <clears throat> it's, it's using instruction swapping to basically look at very specific function calls. So, for instance, someone will tell me, you know, we've got this application, it's running on our appliance, it's running really slow. I'm like, okay, well, I'll run a Dtrace that actually does 
look at a whole bunch of different calls. But the first thing I'll usually do, because everyone does this, is look at their I.O. calls. And I'll look at the size of their I.O. calls, and I will find out they are reading and writing 80 bytes at a time to a log file. I'll be like, that is why your application is slow. Um, and then we fix that. But Dtrace is amazing for this stuff. And it's just, it's, it has made my life far easier. Uh, networking, by the way, I, I'm a networking person normally. Uh, well, I'm an abnormal networking person, but I do work on a lot of networking. So <clears throat> FreeBSD because it was involved, BSDs and FreeBSD because they were involved in the original network protocols, long-term uh, commitment to doing good networking. So for instance, almost every embedded system has taken one version or another of the BSD network stack and put it on it. So I happen to have code on Mars, which is the BSD, for, uh, the pre-FreeBSD BSD 4.4 network stack is communicating between the Mars rovers and here, right? So that, that code just runs everywhere, including on Mars. Um, so some of the newer, well, IPFW and PF are not that new. They are the longstanding uh, packet filters. PF in particular comes from OpenBSD. IPFW was native to FreeBSD, goes along with dummy net, um, <clears throat> firewalls. More recent features, which are pretty nice, um, if you're building something like an actual appliance, it are things like NetMap, and actually in the uh, virtual, in the cloud world, Vale is probably more interesting, but NetMap gives you very direct access to your network drivers, the network devices. So normally, when you connect with a socket, you go to the kernel, and the kernel gives you some memory, and it's all this work that gets done, and we do a lot of work for you, but if you don't want us to do that work, you can bypass us by using this thing called NetMap. Uh, Intel has something similar called DPDK, which also runs around FreeBSD. And this is what people have been using to do really high performance networking stuff where they don't care about TCP. Once you care about TCP, you've got a huge number of problems. But if all you want is raw network data, um, NetMap is the way to go. Vale is the switch that sits on top of that. And then more interesting in a cloud environment is the VXLAN stuff. So VXLAN is what allows people to, for some odd reason, put Ethernet in UDP over IP for data centers, which is something they want. I think it's going to all end in tears, but they wanted it, so we gave it to them. Um, I, it's, it's very useful. It scares the heck out of me. Um, so what are we going to do next? You know, and we've had this 20 year, 20 plus year history with this operating system. Couldn't we just be done? Um, clearly not. So uh, some of the things we're working on right now, and a lot of this is going to go into our next release, which is FreeBSD 11. Um, Scaling, so everybody knows about massively multicolor systems. Nobody knows how to program them, but we think we do. Uh, at least the operating system will be fast. Your application won't be. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, right? People are like, oh, you've got this multicore system with all these threads, and it's going to be great. And you're like, yeah, did you rewrite your application to know about any of that? No, no, it's just going to be great, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, but it is going to be great on FreeBSD. So uh, scaling to more cores, we currently scale to 256 cores. Uh, we'll, of course, keep upping that. Uh, there's a bunch of things in the kernel that you have to do to make sure that synchronization doesn't destroy, like that doing the synchronization doesn't remove all your performance. Um, networking queues, if anyone does 10 or, <clears throat> anyone does 10 or 40 gig networking, which I do, um, all your network cards to be able to actually get data through them, uh, you need to be able to apportion data to different queues in the network stack, uh, and the network drivers, and then NUMA, non-uniform memory access. So if you've bought a dual processor machine from Intel recently, you don't actually have an SMP box. What you have is an acetate, a piece of acetate, with two processors that sort of communicate. Um, and that means that if you've allocated memory in the wrong place, your application goes really slow. And so we have to figure that out for you. That's what you means. ARM64, this is actually kind of interesting to people who are in the sort of data center space. ARM is pushing really hard to try and displace Intel in the data center. And their push is around this ARM64 stuff. Uh, and that uh, FreeBSD, they have actually worked with the project and the FreeBSD Foundation, I've got my advertising on, um, to uh, roll out ARM64, and that's gonna be in the next release. So if you look at, for ARM64 online, you'll see that we're booting on what they call their foundation models. When they, before someone puts out a chip, they put out this sort of software simulator, so we're running on top of that stuff. So when ARM64 actually arrives in data centers, and we actually have a, a test box from Cavium that just arrived today, and was defrosting because it's at a data center in Canada. The guy said, we, we don't plug things in the moment they come off a truck in Canada. I'm like, all right. 
<laughs> when it warms up, let me know. Um, so we're gonna run on real hardware probably by next week. Um, huge amount of virtualization features. The serial thing should be fixed, if not now, very soon, by the way. that You mentioned that, yeah. So that and the, um, there's a bunch of block IO stuff, which I think m has more to do with Zen virtualization, not KVM. But I know that those are the two big things people have been talking about in terms of virtualization features. So this, the serial stuff will be fixed soon. Um, back on networking, a lot of networking uh, features. So MPTCP is uh, how you're, if you've got a more recent iOS version, uh, this is the thing that allows you to, to migrate easily between multiple networks because your TCP connections don't break because it's multi-path TCP, more than one path. Very important for mobile. Um, DC TCP is data center TCP. So it turns out that TCP was designed in a time when all of the machines were communicating over very long lengths at very low speeds. And we've done a reasonable job of tuning the algorithms between then and now, but not as good a job as we might like. So when you have a lot of machines with very low latencies and very high bandwidth, TCP does not make as effective use of the network as it possibly could. So DC TCP, which was done um, by some research folks, Vidori uh, Kato, I think that's her last name, and uh, some folks at Network Appliance, uh, that'll be in FreeBSD 11. And then last thing on the list, um, all your new, if you're using actual hardware, will come with this secure boot UEFI thing, which Microsoft swears will make your machine more secure. I don't know what happens when Microsoft swears something will be secure, but you're gonna have it anyway. Um, the problem is that all operating system vendors, Linux, us, well, of course Windows has it already, um, everyone's gonna have to support that to boot on modern hardware. So we're working on that right now. Um, Here's more information. I want to I want to put up something very quick. So, ACM was mentioned earlier on. There's going to be a, a practitioner, as we call it, a conference here in New York at the end of February. It's called Applicative. Um, I encourage people to go check out the website. It's going to be really interesting. There's both a systems and an application uh, track. The systems is more traditionally like what I was probably just talking about. Um, the application development is more uh, people on front end and and that kind of stuff. You know, JS style development, that kind of thing. So uh, check out Applicative, quick thing there. Um, but if you want more information about what I just talked about, um, freebsd.org is the project, freebsdfoundation.org is the foundation. The foundation exists to be a legal entity to prevent people from suing us out of existence. And we also fund things like data centers and all the things that stuff sits on, mailing list forms and a handbook. Any questions? <sighs> yes? Um, so you mentioned the Warp 64 and UEFI. Um, one thing I've come aware of is, is uh, including these ARM machines, um, something called u -boot. Yep. What, what's we, the... We have a u -boot port that deals with that. So we, we boot on um, I mean, what, what's, what's like the difference? I mean, like... You can, oh, okay. You can so like, technically? Yeah, if you want. So... You don't want me to do that. <laughs> I worked on embedded systems for five years. Okay, but um, so, so in a traditional um, Intel Windows world, you had the BIOS, basic input output system. And that handled all of that stuff. It's like, oh, you turn on the machine, and I look at the boot block, which is, and find something, and it's like, oh, well, that, that block can only be this long, and that's why you wind up with three bootloaders, because you load the first one, which is small, and the second one, which is bigger, and the third one, which is just right, like Goldilocks used to say. Um, and that's sort of the, the whole Intel, Wintel world of booting. But embedded systems have always had something, had many different things. So like early embedded systems were really primitive and you had to program everything into the kernel so the kernel would know where all your memory was and where was the NIC and you, know, you had to know the specific like hex address and you wrote that into a file. That's bad. Um, well, or at least problematic. So U-boot is kind of the moral equivalent of what you get out of the BIOS. So like you boot and there's these basic environments that will give, that will tell you things like where is the first block on disk and where does memory actually start and all the things I need to know to start up as an operating system. But, and then that's sort of encoded in, I mean, U boots another open source project, right? So there's a U boot project and everyone who wants to work on embedded tries to plug themselves into that because they're the ones who've gone and figured out all the things like, oh, you've got a Raspberry Pi versus a BeagleBone Black and the Raspberry Pi version A has memory that starts here and this, you know, that kind of stuff. They've done that in the U-boot stuff. So we, 
there's a U-boot port. That's how I boot my BeagleBone uh, for doing that stuff. And then UEFI is BIOS on steroids, right? So the BIOS stuff was written in a really primitive period where you know, the people who did like sunboxes and deck boxes and the big iron at the time kind of laughed at the, at the BIOS. They're like, that's ridiculous. You know, like get a real operating system, you know, get a real system. They're no longer here, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the bias thing went out, but yes, UFI is huge. And that's what you wind up getting to when you've got a very complicated uh, hardware layer that has to be abstracted in some intelligent way that any operating system can come along and say, oh, well, where's the disk? And where's the, mostly where's the disk, where's the console, where's the memory? And then after that, we can usually work stuff out, but without that, we can't, can't really do anything. But what I've played with in U-Boot so far, it seems that it's just a config file. Yep. There's a lot of them, though. There's one for every single piece of hardware anyone's ever developed, and that's, what, that's the value there. And there's regular porting efforts around that. I mean, it's in the, this, this U-Boot files used to be you're pulling it from Git. Now it's all the previous ports. If U-Boot is heavily worked on and heavily used, especially yeah, on the security arm stuff. Yeah, I mean, the Linux guys use it too, everybody uses it. Other questions? All right, thank you very much.